I know a lot of time has passed, but uh, I'm compelled to ask you, how's your farfic dootin'? Well, we'll find out shortly. Stay with us. Yeah, I know. Some people say golf is just a good walk wasted. But it's also a car. It's gone through so many different variations and permutations. Sold all over the world, built all over the world. And for 2022, we have the Golf R from Volkswagen. And this thing, good God Almighty. Now, there are a lot of fun cars on the road. A lot of these little boxes that have, uh, you know, a tire at every corner to aid stability and handling and fun factor. But man, this thing has got the goods. Underneath the hood is a turbocharged four cylinder engine that, uh, well, just wait till we talk about it at length. Let's just say, it's wicked strong for such a small car. <laughs> and this is teamed with an with a equally impressive transmission and a special torque vectoring all-wheel all drive system. And all these things together produce a really mad car. I mean, this is crazy. And yet, it looks fairly normal. It looks reasonable. You could drive this to work every day. Why not? People will think you're practical. People will think there's a, there's not a wild lion driving that thing. There's but a nice little kitty. This ain't no kitty. And this ain't no croquet. This is the golf. And let's look at the heart of this beastie beast. The engine. Ladies and gentlemen, friends all. Before I show you the power plant of this particular golf R, a disclaimer, what you're gonna see you may find rather frightening. And it's not because there's anything inherently frightening about the engine itself, oh no, it's, it's a beauty. But it's supposed to have a cover on it, and it does not. Where is this cover, you ask? I have no idea, it could have been blown off at high speeds because this thing is a, is a veritable hell beast on the highway. Or perhaps some mechanic somewhere is wearing it as a hat. Could be. I've seen stranger things. But ladies and gentlemen, here is our two liter turbocharged inline four cylinder engine in all its glory. See, without the engine cover on it, it kind of looks like an electrician threw up, you know? But there it is. And this little, little tiny little economical power plant <laughs> Puts out 315 horsepower and has 295 pounds of feet in terms of torque. That's amazing for a car that probably weighs, what, 70 pounds? Well, it's heavier than that, but it's a very light car because it's a very small car. And you've got this amazingly powerful engine underneath here. And this is made, you got two choices with the R, either a six-speed manual transmission or what they put on this one, which is a seven speed direct transfer, du dual clutch monster vision, uh, seven speed automatic transmission with paddle shifters for manual operation, of course. But man, this is, a, this is an interesting thing. Now this, you, you actually, since there is no cover on here, you can actually see what the heck we're dealing with in terms of this beast. And as you can see, one, two, three, four. And there's, as you see at the back here, oops, sorry. Back here is where our turbo, our turbo charger is, right there. Come forward and here's our uh, intake system right there. 
And what we have here is a, is a very, well, it is naked. I'll give it that. <laughs> but it is a, uh, when you really look at it, when you really get a, get a good gander at this thing, it doesn't look all as complex as you might think. Uh, turbocharging adds quite a bit of complexity. There's no question about that. And it also has direct injection, fuel injection, which adds a degree of complexity. There's as much wiring as there are hoses. You know, that's the way these things are. But here's an interesting thing right here. Near as I can tell, this right here, this box here has a filter in it. Comes around here and I believe that feeds directly into your turbocharger. So there's probably some kind of cooling involved. Air comes in here, right here, goes through the box, goes around into the turbocharger. Yes, but, but what you asked, what about the intake system up front? Where, where does that come from, that air? I don't know. Uh, I can't really tell you right off the bat. I don't know. Ah, ah. There's the beginnings of the uh, system. I wonder where, huh. I'm not sure. It's somewhere around here. I'm looking for you. I am looking, I am looking. And I don't see any big direct air supply thing going in there, which is unusual for fuel injection systems. But I'm sure it's, it's sussed. It's coming from somewhere. <laughs> as long as I don't have to change the air filter. I mean, maybe both of them come out of this, this box over here. I, I don't know. Huh. But anyway, that's a wicked amount of power for a little engine, for a little two-liter engine. I mean, that's the kind of thing they could only dream of a decade or two ago. That's, that's some serious power production. Oh, golly, I'm hot today. And man, you can feel it when you drive this thing. I guarantee you that. It's a nice engine. Peaky? Yes. But we'll discuss all that during our driving adventure. Splendid. Shall we make it a shilling a hole? Mm-hmm. And speaking of shillings, what price are 2022 Golf R 2.0T in lapis blue? Lapis? Blue metallic, well, I'll tell you what, it's a mono-spec vehicle, meaning that there's not a whole lot of options, i.e. none. So, uh, it has everything you need. It, as, you, as we will go through everything, it has a full technology package, and the performance package, and everything you need. Uh, and what will it price you? Well, it'll price you at four to $5,440. If you look at the comparison between this and like the Subaru RX, they're in the same ballpark when it comes to cost. So uh, that's what you have to deal with if you're going to buy one of these beautiful, beautiful machines. Uh, and it's actually, since it is a mono spec, it's nice because they did a real good job of equipping it as I think most people are going to gonna want it. I mean, uh, you do have a transmission situation where you have the 7-speed uh, DSG as opposed to, I believe, there's another, uh, I think there's a 6-speed manual available for it. Uh, but the, uh, the direct shift gearbox, the DSG, is kind of worth the money. I mean, it depends on who you talk to, but an awful lot of people really, really like that gearbox. Uh, I find it to be good, too. I mean, it, it seems to suit the personality of the, the machine pretty well. And, uh, and like I said, what, are you, what else are you going to want to put on this thing? I mean, you, you, got your, you got your tight and black leather interior. And you got your clim uh, climatronic touch three zone automatic climate control with advanced air filter. And God knows with some of your friends, you get off the, the golf course and they're all, you know, fragrant. So uh, trust me when I tell you, it is very, very well equipped for the money. And that's all we need is well equipped for the money. Are you ready to see the brakes on this thing? That's what that R stands for. Woo boy, look at that. 19 inch wheels, massive caliper, massive rotor, massive drilled rotor, I should say. So that's good because you need that kind of <laughs> stopping power when you have so much going power. 
It's a yin-yang kind of thing, which I realize is more of an Asian thing than a German thing, but it, they all get along, you know. We're all one big happy planet now. Well, look at here. Each one of the cylinders has its own exhaust pipe. Well, I don't think that quite works that way, but four pipes, four cylinders. I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Okay, and you look everywhere. Where the heck is the thing that I use to open the hatch? Why, it's right here. A feature I love. There you go. And there you are. And back here, look at all the space we have, quite a bit. And you have a, a ski through, and you have 60, 40 uh, seat back fold down for additional space. And it's got quite a bit for such a small car. This is very impressive. And what do we have down here? Here's our spare, oh no. No, no, that's not a spare. That seems to be a uh, some kind of base resonator unit so you can shake the neighbor's windows and stuff when you come home from work. Uh, I don't see any kind of spare or anything here, actually. Oh, wait a minute. Right there. That's probably a flat repair kit right here. I believe that's it right there. But no temporary spare. And that's a shame. But that's the way it, of the world. Now, something else I, I got to show you that I love. When you put it in reverse, this actually pops up like this. And there's a camera right underneath there that now can see behind the car. So why is that great? That is great because it keeps the camera lens clean, even in the most inclement weather. So you always have a nice, clear backup screen. And that's brilliant. That's really good thinking. That's a valuable asset. Always try to hit through the ball. So welcome to the latest and one of the greatest virtual cockpits. It's what is called as, according to the Monroni, <coughs> this is Volkswagen's Digital Cockpit Pro, which is uh, a fancy way of saying we have uh, a flat screen system designed to mimic the analog instruments of old without actually being the analog instruments of, of old. Incidentally, that, that sound you may be hearing is rain. So uh, I apologize for that. Well, what do you think, son? I keep playing. I don't think the heavy stuff's gonna come down for quite a while. You're right. But we can't stop because life goes on, Indy. We must continue with our pursuit of this incredibly interesting little car. But right now, uh, this is the particular cluster and settings that I have chosen. Naturally, there is a uh, bewildering variety of choices. Uh, and we have all kinds of things we can change. One of the things you'll see to the left that I just shifted to is fuel tank display. See, I thought it was very important to have that. If we go up to gear display and activate that, it tells us we're in park. But as you can see, as you peruse all the rest of the instruments, you really don't know what, what, it, what you've got left as far as uh, fuel, unless you look at the tiny little fuel gauge down at the bottom. So I like having something a little bit more substantial than that. So that's where I could switch to the fuel tank display. And what else we have? What our assist systems are doing, our operating temps, let's, let's have a look at that. Look there, there's all our operating temperatures. And this is on the left side uh, alone. This is very similar, if you may recall, if you made it through the uh, GMC <laughs> Sierra Ultimate uh, review, which was unusually long. Uh, but that cockpit in that particular vehicle is also very, very chock full of uh, changes that you can make if you so desire. But anyway, there's our a lot of different trans uh, excuse me temperature indicators for various liquid systems aboard this vehicle performance what's that look like well that's kilowatts per hour that we're delivering <laughs> I guess <laughs> sorry about that oh I just hit the uh, I hit the middle display when I was supposed to be playing with the, the one on the left okay back back here sorry 
You play a Slazenger 1, don't you? Yes, why? Well, this is a Slazenger 7. Here's my Penfold Hearts. Well, you must have played the wrong ball somewhere on the 18th fairway. We are playing strict rules, so I'm afraid you lose the hole and the match. All right. Uh, charge pressure. Now, this is good. This is uh, what your turbocharger is doing because this vehicle does have a 2-liter turbocharged engine with a whole lot of horsepower. Matter of fact, it has, uh, what is it? Uh, 315 out of 2 liters. That's amazing. But as you can see right now, our little motor is, uh, uh, our turbocharger is putting out 5 uh, PSI of boost as we sit here and idle, which that sounds like a lot to me. Well, what happens if I rev the engine? Whoa, look at there. Then down to 3. Look at there, look at all that revving going on. That inside counter is kind of telling us. What the hell is that inside counter tell, telling us anyway? Well, anyway. If you're interested in your boost, thar she, she, thar she blows. Start, stop, whether or not that's on. Torque distribution. Now, this is part of the all wheel drive system, I guess, that will tell you uh, which particular animal in the form of the wheels is. Uh, is the most aggressive at the moment which one is providing most of the thrust forward as you zoom along in your rally situation so if we go off now to the right da -da, time travel and distance average fuel economy economy no display so they do offer different ones over on the right side acceleration what's that look like whoa look at that is that just a speedometer I don't know. But anyway, you can play with this ad nauseum for days. To set up, oh, you can put charge pressure on both sides. That's good for your binocular vision. Uh, and a G meter. They'd love to put G meters in cars now. Like, what the? Anyway. Uh, so, that's what we have. And you can select. I'm going to go back up to fuel tank because I like a lot the bigger fuel tank display. There we are. And uh, in the right, our uh, speedometer is still there, of course, but in within is our G meter. So do I really want that in there? Uh, charge pressure I like, so I'll put that in the middle. There we go. So you see, this is the Virtual Cockpit Pro that gives you all these amazing uh, variations. And in the middle of that, what are you looking at? You're looking at the uh, nearest available. <laughs> speed limit sign which is actually not very close to here but that's if i was to go out on the road from this location that would be the speed limit 35 so kudos to that so its companion in crime is the central display which is also they like this orange i'm sure i can probably change that if i go down here i can probably settings radio media is that it is that is that it is that all the settings I get? I don't read up radio settings. I don't want. Let's see what's uh, where's vehicle. Uh, let's see. Hang on, hang on. Go no, no, there. There we go. Vehicle. Ah, there we are. Please wait. On well, what? And uh, here on the exterior, we have various things you can adjust, like your exterior lights. Your tires you can't adjust, but I reckon it can tell you what your pressure is or something, which we already know. Oh, good. This is uh, if you need to reset your uh, tire pressure monitor, you can uh, do that right here. And you can put a speed warning on your tires, and warning comes up at 20 miles an hour. That I have no idea what that means. Interesting though. Okay, back to vehicle. So then. Uh, if we go to interior, the cockpit heads up display. The heads up display I have deactivated, but I can make it active. And there it is. Can you see that? Can you see that little thing there? Well, anyway, we'll do that right there. And then position and brightness. So that's that's basically that that for there. And we'll go back here in cockpit. Now I'm wondering if we do. Uh, no, I don't, I don't see anything right off the bat in terms of being able to change the color of the cluster. But it seems unlikely that you wouldn't be able to do this. Information and data on your, uh, no doubt, fuel economy. Yeah, 
we've been getting lately about 23 miles per gallon which is I would say that's lousy for such a compact vehicle but considering it's 315 horsepower <laughs> that's not too bad actually so that's all that and then down here it gets interesting here as well because we have uh, believe it or not this little nub this little giant flip switch I don't even know what to call it exactly but this is how we select our transmission so with my foot on the brake there I just put us in reserve or reverse reserve neutral Re, uh, reverse and naturally we have some very very nice uh, backup camera action and uh, also uh, the perimeter here is designated with uh, parking assist so that it'll tell you if you're about to run into something as you're backing up very nice and if I want to go into drive that's how I go into drive and if you go on down one more we go to S and S is of course our manual speed mode etc and our manual shifters around here manual one two three up one two three and down that's what we do so we can go back up oh wait a minute trying to go back to drive No, it doesn't want to go back to drive. Now, how do I do that? Hang on now. We all need to know how to do this. If I want to go back to drive, it says off here if I do that. Uh, still on manual. Maybe if I put it in the park and the engine dies. <laughs> and I go back to... It's still in that. There we go. I think if you just hit it again, that's for some reason it wasn't participating but if you just hit it there that'll take care of your uh, you're going from uh, manual mode to automatic mode uh, needs that you you have from time to time so what else do we have here we have this nice tiny little cluster here which uh, here's a menu for uh, parking I'm not ex entirely sure oh here we have the parking sensor yeah there we go there's our there's our array of parking sensors uh, there's not much we can do to actually change anything there but we can actually use them. uh yeah well we'll turn that off because that's just uh, that's annoying me what do we have here well, that's not what I wanted here we go uh, now here's our various settings for we have custom we have race now, they're encouraging racing in this car. Hmm. Then we have sport, and then we have comfort. And of course, these are also reflected down here in the center here. So if we go to sport, that should change. Oh, oops. That's not what I told you to do. Man, I'm telling you. I'm trying to get back to this. Working my way back to you, babe. There we go. There's sport and there's race. Drift. There's a drift setting. There's a special setting. There's a custom setting. So you got all kinds of electronic hoo-ha here that you can uh, you can mess with. And again, if you may remember from our review of the Atlas, they, they do all kinds of little things with the graphic that's fun. For example... Comfort looks like that. See, you got your nice road. It's all comfortable. And then race. We're gonna. We're on a racetrack. Look at there. That's cool. And then, well, this is only sport. This is approaching the racetrack. And then, ah, so little time. And then, there we go. Race. Yay! And then, wait, wait. What's drift look like? Drift is only intended for closed driving tracks and should only be used when the driver has the appropriate driving skills. Are you sure that? <laughs> oh yeah. Are we sure? Activate. I just want to see the picture. Come on, you piece. Special. Okay, back to drift and activate. Drift. Oh, that's not very exciting. If you're gonna do the exciting graphic, give me an exciting graphic. Well, anyway, as you can see, this is a, this is an entertaining card. 
and something interesting has happened to my uh, I must have bumped something because now look at this display it's got gears up top I think and it's got charge pressure on the right and good great googly boo maybe this is something with the drift mode I need to get out of this mode I'm in. I, mu I must get, this is the calm mode for me. Here, let's go back to comfort seat. There we go. <laughs> so it, it, you're, it also changes your instrument cluster on some of these settings, so okay. So what else do you guys wanna know? Well, <clears throat> there is a radio. Um, if you do anything in this car, you have to go to this little square, which is your, your home team, your home base. And uh, it is a true touch screen. As you can see, there are no radio knobs. There are no knobs anywhere on this car. They have dispensed with the circular rotary knob completely on this vehicle. And if you are a person who does not like them, see even the, look at this, even with the uh, headlights and everything, there is nothing, nothing here but, but touch screen stuff. So like uh, the Enterprise and Next Generation, it's just like driving a microwave. You got all your touch screen. But there it is, it's trying to access my phone. I did not give it permission to do that right now, but you know. And we have a navigation system that, uh, let me see, can you go straight to map? just want to go what if I just want to go to the map I don't think it's gonna let me do that well wait a minute that's probably it map hey well done okay so <clears throat> anything else you want to see on this thing oh what's all this stuff well here this is all the things I was using to navigate the uh, virtual cockpit <laughs> excuse me and then uh, we also have over here, oh, by the way, that's your, your heated steering wheel. Always nice to have. And over here, we have your uh, Beaucoup d'Argent, or your collection of uh, cruise control, adaptive cruise control. Distance from the vehicle in front of you, front and back, uh, set and reserve, uh, re resume, as you well know. Now, what's R do? Well, it's another way of getting very quickly into the drive modes you see but it on well, not every drive mode. it'll only go to race I guess that's all it gets just, it, R means race so it just goes instantly to race changes the virtual cockpit to that and and there you go and Bob's your uncle and in order to get back I guess you got to go to the mode and go back to comfort now, if you are not real super big on touch screens, and I am not for a variety of reasons, the main reason I don't like touch screens is this. With regular knobs and switches, in a very short period of time, you can become accustomed to where everything is, and you can do all kinds of things without ever taking your eyes off the road. With this kind of a system, where it's uh, completely touchscreen, you have to take your eyes off the road to navigate the touchscreen. Now, a lot of vehicles, and I don't know if this is one of them, I haven't seen any indication that it is, but a lot of, more of it, they want you to voice guidance. Yeah, they want you to use your voice to do everything. I have real problems with that, just because uh, it, 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 in, in so many circumstances, it doesn't make sense to use your voice. You've got the radio on, you've got a passenger in the car. <clears throat> There's all kinds of things that will uh, will irritate. <laughs> or, or uh, Well, let, let's try something here. All right, I'll go over here and I'll hit the voice. What would you like to do? Uh, play auxiliary you can operate the radio and media now here are some examples of what you could say for climate control i am too go away woman so anyway <clears throat> there are very varying degrees of how well voice systems work and what they're actually able to do on the vehicle in question but the bottom line is when you get back to it you still ultimately are ending up with a touch screen and that is problematic to me because you still need to be able to keep your eyes on the road 
and uh, things should be familiar to you. And even if you get really familiar with the touch screen, you still have to look to, at the screen, take your eyes off from here, down to here, and find what you're looking for. That's my, my main beef with a lot of the new systems on cars. Uh, but there, you know, this is, <clears throat> all this stuff is in its infancy. It's being tried out on the, the uh, customers, unfortunately. But in time, they're gonna fine tune stuff so that it makes a little more sense. And I think what we will ultimately end up with is a combination of touchscreen virtual stuff and some tactile stuff. And, and it's a mess right now on just about every car I drive. There's, there's things that, at least to me, don't make a whole lot of logical sense. So anyway. What else is there to show you? That's pretty much it in the cockpit of the Golf R. And uh, I think the most important thing about this car is like a lot of really well engineered little cars, it has a lot of room in it considering it's a very small car. Uh, and it's also got a very nice level of trim. It's got the usual requisite LEDs in the doors that make the doors look really cool and it's got a fair amount of room in it it really does if you're a taller occupant i think you'd feel fit just fine in the front seat we'll have to take a look in the back seat but we're going to have to do that on a day when it's not raining so much and it's not so dark <laughs> but anyway we need the rain so there you are the golf r interior you've survived it well done Kick him out raw hard. Strange how this car inspires country music. It doesn't really, but how do you explain such things? Well, maybe it's a fun factor. Because like the WRX Subaru, this is a very fun car to drive. Very entertaining. And if you're a person who has a uh, situation where you have to commute every day, Especially if you're not just sitting on uh, in traffic on a highway or something like that. You actually have a, a number of roads that are, uh, well, let's just say have turns in them, changes of, of eleva in elevation, all that kind of thing. This is a real fun car. This could help your commute by making it entertaining. And we all need more entertainment, God knows. And this kind of entertainment, you provide yourself with the help of the car. But uh, overall, I, I'm amazed at how similar in, in purpose the Subaru WRXs and the Volkswagen Golf R are to each other. And yet they are so completely different in character as far as how they feel to drive. Uh, and both of them are great. You know, I wouldn't turn down either one of them. Uh, the <laughs> Subaru has a little more room in it. More of a sedan situation, obviously. It's a bigger car. Um, and for a lot of people, it would be more practical. But if you don't have this huge requirement for room, I mean, there is room in the back seat for human beings. There's no question in this car. Uh, and. It's not like the Subaru is just the epitome of room in the back seat. But overall, they're both real purpose-fed vehicles in that their primary uh, mission in life is entertaining and exhilarating performance. And they both do really well in that regard. No question. But my God, they seem so different in personality. One's German, one's Japanese. Both of these cars have considerable American design influence because the U.S. is an enormous car market, or has been. I mean, as we all know, it's been overtaken by SUVs and pickups. Uh, and will that change? I think it's gonna change in time. Uh, real hard to say. But people, I think, will always be drawn to a car like this that is, is will deliver performance in every aspect of its driving. 
It has excellent uh, acceleration. 315 horsepower from a little car like this. It's kind of crazy good. And uh, excellent handling without having a really punishing ride. And, and excellent brakes. Smooth, progressive. Basically what you want in your brakes. The kind of thing that keeps all this power under control when necessary. Oh, you can release the hounds, or loose the hounds, as Shakespeare said. It is loose the dogs of war, right? Yes, I believe it is loose them. The implication being, let them go. And this car has a lot of hounds. But it can also... Uh, I haven't been getting, according to the uh, onboard computer that is supposedly measuring this accurately, I haven't been getting great mileage for a car this size. I, what pops into my head is it should get about 30 miles per gallon in mixed drive. Uh, it doesn't. It, this one's getting 24.7 and I haven't really been hammering it at all. Although it's tempting. to really let the thing go. I haven't really done that much. Just enough to get a feel for how the suspension does and things like that. Another real interesting thing about this engine, and uh, I actually need to uh, change the mode to say, uh, well, it's, it's, it says it's on sport. I didn't put it on sport. Race, what the hell is race after all? Well, it's, it's, you got this nice little quadrant up here that shows you what gear you're in. That's racy. <laughs> uh, the steering, eh, it might be a tad stiffer. Uh, hard to say. But the shifting is definitely different. There's definitely a different algorithm at play when you put it in the race mode. Uh, but I wonder about that. You know, I wonder about the whole thing of, of just encouraging a, a uh, mode such as race for today's street tuners and stuff like that maybe not a great idea I'll go back to comfort by contrast now there's no huge dramatic difference steering is good everywhere but uh, what I was actually coming in <laughs> A very large circle to talk about is how uh, as potent as this engine is it's very it's got excellent manners it doesn't uh, have a huge it definitely has a hit of power in the higher rpms but it's a very uh, smooth manageable hit of power it's uh, and that I, I find engines that just take off when you give them some gas and then spool up and, and just put you in the back of the seat yeah, they're exhilarating for a few minutes, but in day-to-day -day driving, that, that behavior can get a little old. This is much smoother than that. It's very, very progressive in its power delivery, which I also find better in terms of just when you want to go fast. I want to go fast. When you go around uh, corners, stuff like that, and you want to pull out of the corner smoothly when you get on the gas uh, right around the apex of the corner and you want to launch the thing out of the corner it's nice to have a nice progressive feedback instead of a sudden hit of power that's true for uh, everything motorcycles cars it's always your friend when you have when you have power that you can modulate easily uh, to suit the exact circumstances of, of the drive what the hell is that noise? Oh, they're doing some tree work over there. We got a lot of that going on. You see, we had the gypsy moth attack about four, four years ago, four or five years ago. Killed so many trees. These obnoxious little caterpillars ate everything, especially the red oaks. They love those red oaks. The more I drive this car, the more I'm gonna miss it when it's gone. And it'll be gone tomorrow. And I'm sad by this. 
And trust me when I tell you that that's not true for all the vehicles I test. Some of them are, I'm glad to get rid of. But I've had a nice string of cars lately that have been uh, really, really pleasant. I've enjoyed them immensely. Let's go here. Back, let's take, take the back road. <laughs> That's what it's called, you see? Back, back, I don't know if you saw there or not. See what I mean? It's very smooth, progressive power. Doesn't pin you. Of course, my God, the roads are falling apart. Up here in, in uh, Northeast Connecticut, you, you, before you know it, you're going from one town to another town to another town to another town. Just when you're out driving around, it's, there's not any real obvious linearity to any of it. It just, boom, you're in a different town. But one of the ways you can always tell is the quality of the uh, roads. Some of these towns can afford to keep their roads up really nicely. Others, their roads are falling apart. And I assume that's a tax base issue and who knows but the fact of the matter is some of these roads I'm not sure why they're, they're choosing to fall apart now because we didn't have an overly wet summer we, we had what I would call pretty close to average maybe a little warmer than usual but not anything crazy like what so much of the rest of the country has experienced and yet it's it's really taking a toll something's taking a toll on the roads and whenever I get a, a car like this that has big wheels and relatively thin tires from the distance from the wheel, if you take a plane across the wheel and go down to the pavement, the amount of tire that you have to absorb shocks is smaller and smaller and smaller as the wheels get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've never seen any real advantage to these larger wheels. Some say, well, it enables you to put larger brakes on. Ah, come on. You, you, they've always been able to put larger brakes on smaller wheels when they want to. They just use a different kind of offset and make room for it that way. And that works really well. But here, here is great joyousness in this little road here. And man, I, I, there's roads I haven't been down in a little while, like uh, let's say several months. I'm coming across them now and man, They've been, they've been beat up. It's almost like we had a small meteor storm of some sort that has, in fact, adversely affected the surface area that you drive on. What happens if I just suddenly hit... Yeah, that's what I thought. If I just suddenly hit the paddles... Listen to that. 4,500 RPM. See why I put it at 45 hours. Sticks like a limpet. A veritable barnacle of a car when it comes to the curvy road. Another thing that's really extremely good on this car is the all wheel drive system which balances torque around. And it really does do a great job at really changing the power output to the wheels depending on what you're on. Uh, in a road like this, when you hit a, a curve and you really get on it, torque increases to the outside tire. To help keep you in line, it works very, very well. It makes it easy to drive the car fast. Which you sometimes wonder if that's a good thing, but yeah, I, I imagine it is. That in, in cahoots with the stability system is probably pretty good for the car overall. I think, it, I think most people would be happy with that because it works good. Whee! We as in elation, not urine. Although sometimes during the elation there can be urine if like a deer runs out in front of you or something like that. But there's a, the only downside for this car to me is I'm just not wild about no knobs. 
Uh, I don't like the touch screen everything approach. It just doesn't work for me very well. And as I said before, once, once you get everything dialed in the way you want it, uh, you can just leave it there and, and you have all, everything everything starts to get very familiar where your particular bits of information are You start to learn how you can navigate that around and change it But there's still something about it. I find overly complex and uh, That's a tough one that you know who's going to ever argue with having adaptability where you can change everything to suit your needs There's nothing wrong with that now we're going to try this little hill here. Oops, there's a car coming. We shall dispatch it. How does it pull on the hills? Pull very good on the hills. I like the pulling on the hill, very effective. Very effective indeed. Nothing's better in a rocket than it being a controllable rocket. A steerable rocket, if you will. This definitely is one of them. Uh, I do enjoy this. Let's look at our map. What's our map tell us? Oh, actually, that's where, we, look at there, that's where we are. It's a very clear, it's, it's one of these high definition units. And what happens if I do that? Uh, ooh. Ooh. Shouldn't have done that. Let's go back. Can we go back? I want to go back. There we go. Very effective. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Gonna go by a high school here. Let us hope the children are not being all unruly. The young adults running amok out in the fields around there. It may, could be recess. I don't think you get recess anymore in high school, but that, that was a long time ago for me in a, in a place far, far away. In a completely different time. So much has changed. Oh my goodness gosh. What ruined athletics for me, because I used to be a basketball player and a competitive swimmer and played football before that, is people started taking it way too seriously. And sports are supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be out there for enjoyment. And instead, we often got in a situation where there was much anxiety about it. it started to eat up your entire life about what was going on in the on the gridiron or on the court whatever in the pool and that was bad as far as I'm concerned for it, it that's a great way of starting out training people to be too serious about stuff that doesn't matter and stuff that's there for a completely different reason than winning now, is this car a winner? Yeah, sure. I think so. I gotta work on my game. No, 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 no. Don't think of it as work. The whole point is just to enjoy yourself. Ich bin ein